Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, you may have noticed that this series took a bit of a break. Uh, it's just because I got through editing the previous batch faster than I thought I would. Um, I recorded all of the videos up to this point in, in one session and edited them afterwards, with the exception of part five, because I went back and re-recorded it. I didn't really like the initial take of it. But now I have to record more parts, uh, and so uh, I, the past week I've just been doing stuff, and so I just didn't have time. But do not worry, this series is not dead. I have more episodes coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a completely different feature. I'm not going to be talking about the web browser uh, today because you guys are sick of the web browser, I'm sure. Uh, it's all I've talked about for the past five parts. So instead, I'm going to be talking about a feature that you probably weren't even aware that the Flashpoint Secure Player had um, because it is kind of a relic of the past. Now, when I was designing the Flashpoint Secure Player, I realized that I was going to be inserting a sort of middleman layer in between the launcher and a good number of games in Flashpoint. And so I wanted to take advantage of that position as much as possible to solve as many problems as I perceived Flashpoint to have uh, and at that particular moment in time. And as such, there are elements of the Flashpoint Secure Player uh, where the design of it, it's not harmful, it's just not very useful anymore. And this is a good example of one. Uh, where there is a fringe benefit still, so I wouldn't get rid of it. Um, but also, it doesn't really serve uh, the original purpose that it was intended to. So I'm going to demo that here. So if I open Flashpoint Navigator... This is the browser that's included with uh, Flashpoint. It's used to play HTML5 games, as well as a few plugins. It's used for the Unity plugin, for example. And if I now go and choose to play a game in Flashpoint that uses uh, the Flashpoint Navigator as well, I'm going to pick this Unity game, you will see that the Flashpoint Secure Player uh, pops up with this error message saying, the process Flashpoint Navigator causes compatibility if conflict with this game. Please close it to continue. And if I now go to Flashpoint Navigator and I close it, the error message automatically goes away, and now the game starts. <coughs> there is the game. So, why does the Flashpoint Secure Player do this? Right? Why does it pop up this error message if you already have Flashpoint Navigator open. Can't it just open the game? Well, the answer has to do with Flashpoint's history, because we weren't always using our own uh, fancy Flashpoint Navigator browser. <clears throat> the browser that we used to be using was called Basilisk, which is the browser that Flashpoint Navigator is forked from. And Basilisk was itself a, a fork of Firefox. And you could actually install Basilisk just normally. Like, you could just, just go to their website, and download their installer, and install it on your system. And you could use that as your main browser if you wanted. And I imagine that a fair amount of Flashpoint's user base actually did. Because uh, one of the features of Basilisk is that it had plugin support. It was an actively maintained browser that had new HTML5 features, but also had plugin support, which was a perfect fit for Flashpoint. That's why we were using it. Uh, but the problem with that is that Firefox and all of its derivatives uh, are single instance browsers. So if you had Basilisk installed normally on your system, and you were using it to just browse the internet normally, and then you opened Flashpoint, and you open the game in Flashpoint that used Basilisk, it would open in the instance of Basilisk that you already had open. So it would completely bypass uh, the version of Basilisk that was included with Flashpoint that had like the configuration all set up to use uh, Flash and, and Unity plugin and, and the Flashpoint proxy and all that. It would completely circumvent all of that and just go and open in 
basically your your regular default browser, which <clears throat> you wouldn't get any sort of error message or any indication that anything had gone wrong. The game would just not work for seemingly no reason, right? And so the purpose of having this message, the intended purpose, was to make it so that if there is already an instance of the browser open, and maybe this is not, you know, the one that's included with Flashpoint, maybe it's just uh, the one you have installed on your system, right? That when you go to play a game, now you'll get an actual error message telling you something is wrong, right? Something is wrong either way, right? The error is going to happen no matter what, but the player is going to inform you that it will happen in a more obvious way, and the hope was that this would make the lives of Flashpoint tech support easier because there would be a recognizable error message for this scenario. In practice, <clears throat> I don't know that this error actually occurred all that often. Uh, I, my goal was to make Nosamu's life easier, uh, and I don't know that I actually did because I don't know that this issue was ever actually encountered in the wild. A uh, quick side note here, you may be wondering why only some of the games that run in uh, Flashpoint Navigator do this, and not all of them. And the reason is that I envisioned at some point that it, that it would be all of them. Um, but when the Flashpoint Secure Player was new, I figured that there might still be bugs in it, and so I didn't want to use it for every like HTML5 game in Flashpoint, because that's a massive library, uh, and so I kind of wanted to slowly roll it out, starting with just the uh, the games that uh, really needed it, uh, some of the more obscure technologies, and then my eventual goal was to work my way up to the point it was stable enough that it could be relied upon for all of the uh, games using, at that time, Basilisk and now Flashpoint Navigator, uh, but that just never really happened as other things uh, required my attention and it was always pretty low priority. So that's why even to date, uh, you know, there's still a config for Basilisk um, in Flashpoint Secure Player, but there just there aren't any games that, that use that. Let's take a look at, at how this works because there is something interesting about it. Uh, you'll notice uh, when, I, when I demo this, I'll, I'll demo it one more time actually. Um, when I do this, if I close the uh, the browser, then that dialog closes on its own. And that's unusual, because in C-sharp, you have a message box dot show function to show a message box. There's no message box dot close method. So how am I doing that? Uh, that's, that's kind of an interesting bit. So let's take a look at the code. <clears throat> so this is the code that runs first uh, when the modification is activated. I decided to start with this modification, um, both because it's kind of interesting, but also because um, some of the modifications in here are really like basic. Like the like the run as administrator modification, for example, is like two lines of code, um, whereas some of them are really complex, like the envir the sorry uh, the registry states um, modification could be like three videos. Uh, and so I wanted to start with one that's sort of like medium complex complexity, and so this is a good starting point. So <clears throat> the modifications are basically the things that happen before the uh, the game starts, right? When you open Flashpoint Secure Player uh, and it's about to launch the game, it runs all the modifications first, if it, like as necessary according to the config file, and <clears throat> this is one of those things that that it needs to check. So, this is the single instance modification. We do a bunch of stuff up front that's just checking if we should actually even use the single instance modification, and then we get to this. This is the first part where we actually do something substantial. So, we get this executable property, and this specifies the name of the executable that we're going to be looking for. Um, we're we're going to be looking for multiple instances of. And you might think, why not just get that like from the command line? Like, why does that need to be specified separately? Well, it's because if you look at Flashpoint Navigator, this FP Navigator thing is actually just a launcher 
the actual browser lives in this folder and it's called Flashpoint Navigator, not FP Navigator. This is just like a, a launcher thingy basically and it exits right away. So I specifically catered um, this modification to this particular use case where the, the executable name might be different than the name of the file that you're actually opening, but if you don't specify it, then it will fall back to using the command line just for the sake of convenience. So it does do that. <clears throat> so after that, uh, we're also passing in the owner. The owner is basically our main form, right? It's this form, the one that you sometimes see. You saw it when I demoed it earlier that has like a little progress bar. Uh, that form is the owner. Um, so we pass that in here too. <clears throat> And then this is where we start to actually do stuff. Now, there's a bunch of uh, variables that just get defined here um, before we enter this loop. Uh, the main important one uh, is this processes by name strict uh, stack, which I will get to explaining in a little bit. But at first, we set it to null. And so we enter this do while loop. And um, the first thing we check is if this variable is null, which it is. So the first time this loop happens, uh, none of this code in this if block is going to happen. So we're just going to ignore that for now because it only happens on subsequent loops. Um, so <clears throat> after that, the first thing that we really do in this uh, do while loop is we get the list of processes with the particular name, which is actually just the executable name without the extension because the get processes by name function it takes in the name of the executable without the extension it can't have the extension on it i'm not really even sure why it just can't so <clears throat> we strip off the extension and then we pass that into this function that's going to get us the list of all processes um, that are called uh, in this example flashpoint navigator now when you're checking for multiple instances of something, usually the ideal way to do that is by using a mutex. I can't do that here because I don't have any control over how Basilisk works, right? So if you have Basilisk just normally like installed on your system, um, I, I can't, you know, add some sort of check there because because mutexes are, are a collaborative effort, right? Both things need to be using it. And so because I can't, like, make it so that the one that's installed already uh, participates in that in, in the mutex um, that we want to use, uh, we can't do that. Now, you might be wondering, what, what do I mean by that, right? What I mean is, <clears throat> usually when you're checking for multiple instances of a program running, in order to avoid race conditions, you want to use a mutex because mutexes are atomic. And what that means is that there is no possibility um, that it could happen. It, it always happens in a specific order. So there's no possibility that you check for it in the middle of it opening. And so it's not actually loaded yet. And so you don't see it. But then it loads and you pass on. A common pattern uh, is just search for, for a window. Right? If I want to have an application that only opens one window, just search for a window with the same name. Like if I wanted, if I want to make Discord only open uh, a single instance instead of opening a new instance each time, just search for a window called Discord. And if it exists, uh, then, <coughs> then uh, just show the existing one. But that doesn't account for if the window is not actually loaded yet, like if that window uh, is still not actually visible because Discord is in the middle of loading. So then it'll be like, oh, there's no window, so I'll load. And then you end up with two instances open because they were both checking for that at the same time. Uh, so usually you want to use a mutex. I can't here because I can't like make it so Basilisk uses a mutex because uh, you know, I just can't, we just don't have control of that from Flashpoint, right? Uh, and so this is not going to be perfect, um, but that doesn't really matter, right? Because it just needs to, I, it just needs to catch it when it can, right? 
the more often that it can catch it, uh, the less likely that it's going to cause a headache for us trying to troubleshoot what the issue is. All right, so it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just nice to have if it works, right? <clears throat> so we get the list of processes with this name, not using a mutex. It's not atomic, so it's not ideal, but it's it's something, right? We get the list of processes with that name. And then we have the next sort of interesting thing here. Uh, so you can set it to be strict or not. So what setting this to be strict means is that it'll only look for the process if it's part of Flashplane. Um, so usually this is off. Uh, in fact, I don't think there's any configuration that turns this on. I might be wrong, um, but it's usually off. <coughs> and so it usually will just check for Flashpoint Navigator or, or previously Basilisk system-wide. It'll, it'll search for any instance that's open. If this is turned on, it'll only search for instances that are within Flashpoint. Like, it has to be this specific um, Flashpoint navigator that's in the MP software folder. Um, and so the way that works is <clears throat> we get we get the full name of the uh, process here using this get process name function. This is just a wrapper over some uh, built-in uh, Windows functions to do this. Uh, we tried the normal C sharp way, which is using uh, process dot main module dot file name, but that can fail in some specific scenarios. So we fall back to the uh, Win API way of doing it, which is query full process image name if we have to. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so we get the full name of the process, and then we compare the paths. And in this compare paths function, you might think this is just doing a string comparison, but it's not. Um, what it's actually doing is it's getting a handle to the one file, and it's getting a handle to the other file, and then it's checking if both of the handles uh, point to the same file. Uh, there's an excellent video by Live Overflow that explains uh, why you should not compare paths uh, just using like a string compare. Uh, that explains it better than I ever could. So I'll link that in the description. But uh, the point is, we check if it's the exact same path. We only care uh, if it is. <clears throat> so if we don't care, then we just dispose uh, of this process here now. Otherwise, we add it to this processes by name strict list from before. And if strict is not enabled, then we just um, we don't apply any filter. We just allow all the processes through into this list. <clears throat> and then we loop back to here. So for as long as there's anything in the processes by name strict list at the end of this loop, we're going to go back to the start, or, or went too far up, here, to this uh, if condition here. <clears throat> and this is where the magic happens with that message box that automatically closes. So before I even get into the, uh, the body of this function, we can just take a look at the arguments because there's quite a few here. You can see I'm passing that uh, the process causes compatibility conflict string in here. That's where this is where that comes from. Um, and then we specify just some normal options for the message box. But down here we have this delegate. Now, if you don't know uh, in C sharp, a delegate is basically uh, like an anonymous function in JS, sort of. Uh, or, or like a lambda. Um, so this is just like uh, an anonymous function, basically, that we're just defining in the middle here and passing as an argument. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of stuff that happens in here, but it's not really important for now. Uh, I'll, come I'll come back to this part, but the most important thing here is that uh, we're calling the wait for exit function on this process. And so this is going to cause the code to wait here uh, for one of the processes in the list from before to exit. Uh, so we'll see that in action in a bit. If we now go into the body of this function, this is actually just a wrap, it's just an overload. So uh, we'll go into the main implementation here. <coughs> so 
here's where we take in the owner. Once again, that is our sort of main uh, window here. That is the owner that we're taking in. Uh, and then we take in like the text, caption, buttons, icon, all of that's normal stuff for a message box. At the very end, we take in that delegate. It's that delegate with the uh, task in it from before that was waiting for the process to exit. Uh, so the first thing that we do here is we create a new form called closable. Now, this is where WinForms is, is going to be WinForms. Um, we can't actually do this by just like doing it because you can't create a new form unless you are on the GUI thread. Now, in practice, this code will never be running outside of the GUI thread, but because this is not in uh, like a class, like a form class, uh, I, I wanted to implement it in such a way where it could work even if it's not in the GUI thread. So the way that you do that in C-sharp is you call the invoke function, and you don't always have to do it. So I have like a wrapper method here. It's like it just invokes if required. Uh, basically, this is kind of just noise. Uh, it's just required uh, to say, hey, this is WinForms code, so treat this like WinForms code. But you can more or less ignore if you see invoke if required. You can just kind of ignore that. <clears throat> um, but the first thing that we actually do is we create a new form called closable. And we set its owner as the the owner form from before. That's our main form, right? Our our Flashpoint Secure Player GUI form. Um, <clears throat> so we set the owner of this form uh, to our main form, but we don't show the closable form, right? If we wanted it to be visible, we would have to do closable dot show, right? We never do that, right? So we just create the form but we don't actually make it visible. And that's going to be important. Now, we come down here. There's actually a bunch of stuff that's happening here, but it's not really important at the moment. The important thing is that we're going to wait for the task, which, remember, it's waiting for the process to exit. So we're going to wait for that process to exit, and when it's done, we're going to continue with this code. And this, ultimately is going to close the closable form that we created before. Now, it was never visible. We never showed it, right? But this is going to destroy it, right? Like, this is going to make it uh, completely gone so that we couldn't show it if you, even if we wanted to, right? So that's going to that's gonna dispose of that form <clears throat> when we are done waiting for uh, the process to exit. All of this stuff I'll, I'll come back to in a little bit. And then <clears throat> we do the actual call to messagebox.show. So we are calling messagebox.show here. Um, but here's the interesting thing, right? Is that we set the owner of the message box as the closable form, right? And that's the form that's, that's not visible, but that doesn't matter, matter. The message box will still show, it'll still be visible, and it'll just have its owner set to this invisible form, which is also owned by us, right? Uh, in, in the previous episode, I actually explained the concept of owned windows a little bit, and this is the same thing here. We're, we're setting them as owned windows. So <clears throat> the upshot is that when we close the closable form, because the message box is owned by that form, it's also going to close. And so through this mechanism, we can actually close the message box even though uh, it is not, um, it doesn't actually have you know, a built-in method to close it. And that's going to cause the message box.show to stop blocking. Uh, and then the only weird thing that we have to deal with after that is um, <clears throat> this dialog results uh, variable uh, message box dot show if if it's closed this way it'll just return like a default option like I think it's uh, it returns um, okay if you do this or maybe it's cancel I don't remember but it returns like a default option and I wanted to differentiate that between the user press the button and we actually you know, closed it ourselves so we check if the task from before ran to completion meaning 
the process actually like exiting, and if so, then we return null instead to signal that um, no button was pressed. The, the message box closed on its own because we closed it, right? And now that I've explained that that's the basic premise that's going on here, I can explain all of the kind of uh, extra weirdness that I skimmed over. So, <clears throat> first off, we're creating this cancellation token source. Um, this is because if the user presses a button on the message box, uh, we still have that task from before running, right? So this task from before that's waiting on the process to exit, it has no idea that the there's a message box and and that there's buttons and that you can press buttons on the message box to make it go away. So this is just going to keep waiting indefinitely until the process is exited, even if that message box goes away for another reason, like the user pressed the cancel button uh, or they pressed OK, which uh, causes it to scan again. That causes the loop to, to go over from the start. So it, it checks, uh, you know, in the event of failure that the process is still actually over. <coughs> And so um, we need to actually like cancel this if the user presses the button. And this is actually an improvement that I made to this lately, which is why this is fresh in my mind. Um, because previously, um, if you hit the OK button, it would start a new task uh, every time that you hit the OK button, which is not a bug per se, because if you eventually you're going to exit the process or you're going to hit cancel. Uh, and so um, eventually all of these uh, tasks waiting for the process to exit are going to resolve, but it's tasks, you know, they use threads, and, and threads are not a cheap resource, right? Uh, if you, you don't want to be just creating a bunch of threads that are just sitting there doing nothing. And so uh, this is the improvement that I added lately, which is cancellation. So this cancellation token source up here, what this is going to do is when the user presses a button on the message box, this is eventually going to say, hey, um, the user pressed the button on the message box, so cancel the task that you're doing. And that, th that communicates the task down here, oh, cancellation has been requested, so I'm not going to, to wait for the process to exit anymore. We actually have a loop going here where wait for exit is being called just for one second, so it's just going to wait a second for the process to exit, and then every second it's going to check is the cancellation requested, right? So that way uh, it'll quit on its own terms, right? We don't actually, it's not like a thread termination where, where we just tell the thread, stop whatever you're doing, right? Uh, we're just telling the task, um, hey, we, we request cancellation, and then whenever it gets a chance, it'll, it'll clean up, uh, and that gives it a chance to, you know, nicely clean up properly. Uh, and so that's why there's all this logic here. Basically what we're doing, we receive the cancellation token from before, and then we copy this uh, processes by name strict stack to a separate one, just so that we're not, like, we're not going to, like, corrupt the existing one uh, for the next time that this loop happens. Right? And then while there's still any processes, uh, instances, because there might be multiple <coughs> instances, right? Uh, with Flashpoint Navigator, there won't be, uh, because it's a single instance application, but we don't know, you know, this is meant to be generic, right? So there might be multiple instances, um, of whatever process we're trying to detect and that we don't want to open yet another instance of. So, <coughs> so we check if there's any of them. Right, and then we pop whichever one is, uh, you know, on top of the stack, and this using block is going to ensure that that gets all cleaned up, so it's going to be properly disposed and everything. Uh, we check that it's not null. We check that the token is is uh, either it's null or or the cancellation is requested, um, and then we just uh, wait for the process to exit. That's what all of this extra code does is all basically just you know set up to get to this wait for exit call and to ensure that this task exits uh, as necessary right <clears throat> and then back here right uh, this is where we actually 
you know, pass in that cancellation token. So we wait on all of the tasks, right? We want to wait for all of the processes to exit, not just not just one, right? And we pass in the token um, that allows us to then signal to it, hey, the, there is a button press. And that's why we have this extra bit up front. And then in the continue with here, we have the uh, function call to handle uh, antecedent task. Is that how you say that? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> in here, uh, it's just, again, this is just some uh, C-sharp things. Uh, if the task from before, like if the wait for exit, the process wait for exit task, if that throws an exception for whatever reason, then it, it's actually, you have to like um, handle it in the continuation yourself. So uh, that's what this is for. It just checks if the task is faulted, meaning the exception is thrown. If it is, then we just re-throw it. That's just something that you're supposed to do uh, when you're continuing a task from before. Um, <clears throat> and then we just close the uh, dialog. So basically all of the extra stuff is really just, you know, to ensure that it all gets cleaned up properly and everything. But the basic premise is just that we're showing a message box that belongs to an invisible form and then closing the invisible form. And because that form belongs to our main form, the message box also behaves as if it belonged to our main form. Uh, so it, it, it behaves like an own window of it. Right. Uh, that's really all there is to that. Uh, and yeah, I have basically explained all the code in here, you know, kind of out of order, but I've explained it. Once all of the uh, processes in the processes by name strict stack are, are popped, they're all gone. Uh, then eventually, you know, we make it down here. We check once again if there's any, but if there isn't any, you know, then this while loop just falls out. And that's it. That's all that's left. Uh, you know, we just continue opening the software like normal. Um, <clears throat> one interesting thing about the single instance modification is that uh, its ordering is very intentional. It's one of the last modifications uh, to be run um, after, you know, the environment variables and, and the register states and all that. And th the reason for that is because like I explained before, it's not using a mutex, it's not atomic, so it has to run nearly last, because one of the modifications, for example, is one that downloads files, right? It's a download file modification, that might take some time, right? So if we checked this up front, if we checked for this uh, at the beginning, when we first opened Flashpoint Secure Player, and then we do a bunch of loading, during that time, right, the other process that we're trying to catch might open. Uh, and so we wouldn't catch it then, right? Because we checked for it, and then we confirmed it was okay, and then the other process opened, so we end up opening multiple instances, right? So we don't want to allow that. So the single instance modification is one of the last ones to happen. Uh, I think if I go in here and I search for a single instance... Uh, and yes, this is where it's activated. So... Uh, you can see it's just this one, and then the only other one that activates after this is the old CPU simulator modification uh, by necessity. Uh, if I ever explain that in the video, I'll explain why it's necessary for this one to be uh, last. Uh, because after that, this function just ends. Uh, and after that point, we actually open the software. So, so this is one of the last things to happen right before the software opens, and it's very much intentional, very much by design, because we don't want to allow a lot of time for another process to open before we open our own, right? That comes back to that mutex issue that I was describing before, where it's not atomic, you know? So we have to do this close to the last. So it's not perfect, right? Because it's not atomic, but uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to uh, catch it when it can, right? It's just helpful to have an error message for this instead of it failing silently whenever whenever it can. Do I think this should be removed? No, because it's not harmful, and also it still has a fringe benefit, which is that it can catch if the browser has hung. Um, because, and I don't know why this is the case, but I've always noticed this as long as I've been using Firefox and its derivatives. Whenever it crashes, 
it has a tendency not to just crash. It has a hen it has a tendency to leave the process hung in the background. So there won't it won't be there won't be any window for Firefox, but uh, it'll just be hung and the process will still be running. I've seen this happen uh, several times. And I have to assume for different reasons over the years, uh, and it happens in Firefox. It happens in Basilisk. I've seen it happen in Basilisk in Flashpoint before. Uh, where it's just hung in, in the background with the window. And if that happens, right, well, it's a single instance browser, so it's going to try and open uh, in the hung instance. And in that case, Flashpoint Secure Player can detect that and say, hey, there's already an instance running. Um, now, as for the message itself, if I open this up again, uh, this message itself could be a little bit confusing if you're not aware that Flashpoint Navigator is already running. I kind of wrote this message on the assumption that, you know, it would normally, this would say Basilisk, right? Like previously this would just say Basilisk. And <clears throat> the assumption was that the reason this error is occurring is because you already have Basilisk open. And so you'll recognize that when you close it. I could have made it so that the OK button kills the process or, or kills all the Basilisk processes that are already running, uh, but I didn't really want to do that just because I figure a lot of people probably just skim these sort of messages and just try hitting OK, and I don't want to be responsible for killing somebody's hours of work and like hundreds of tabs that they had open in a browser instance. You know, I don't want that responsibility. So. I made it so that the OK button just, you know, scans again to check again if the browser is open, even though it's kind of pointless because if it's working as it should, uh, this dialog will just go away on its own um, whenever the browser is closed. <clears throat> but uh, so you might think, you know, why even have the OK button? Then? Why not just have uh, like a cancel button? I don't think it's actually, I don't know if it's actually possible to have just the cancel button on a dialog. Um, I think it would have to be just an OK button, but uh, the point being, I wanted there to be two buttons because um, <clears throat> if it was just one button, right, if it was just OK, then it might seem like, oh, it's just an informative message. And again, you know, I know people don't really read error messages. They just skim them, right? And so um, the idea is that you hit the OK button and then it opens the dialog again and then, you know, you might actually pay attention to the message because you realize that, oh, I can't actually continue unless I do something, right? If uh, it was just cancel, then people would probably be confused when they press that and it just goes away and nothing happens, right? Uh, and so <clears throat> it's kind of just like a, a UI trick. And again, you know, I'm not really a, a UI designer, but... Uh, I, that was sort of the logic behind having two buttons. Even though the OK button doesn't really do anything unless, you know, it's not working as intended and some sort of error occurred, which it's nice in that situation. <clears throat> but anyway, um, I guess the point of this is if you ever see this error message occur and you are like Flashpoint uh, tech support, now you know why. It's because the browser is already running, and it used to be more useful to detect this, but now uh, I imagine that it rarely happens. Um, you can use Task Manager to, to solve this by just ending the process, but if the user doesn't know how to do that, then a restart should always resolve this issue. Um, so hopefully that was interesting, even though this is not really a feature that's used for its intended purpose anymore. Um, <coughs> So yeah, like I said, this series is not dead. I'm going to be recording more episodes of this. Uh, it's just on a short break right now uh, as I'm working on other things. But uh, don't worry, I have more in the works. So I'll see you next time.